Welcome to History Bites, Sex and Power. I'm noted television personality, Rick Green, and together you and I are gonna explore the mysterious connection between sex and power. Look! Ah! Oh my God, it's Rick Green from TV on History Bites. It's that guy I told you about. It's him! Ah! Here we go again. Sex and Power, a wet, tongue-in-cheek look at the rich and randy who turned the corridors of power into tunnels of love. Sex and power go together. Just ask any anthropologist or sociobiologist or teenager. A guy gets the upper hand, the power, by getting sex. A girl gets the upper hand by withholding or rationing sex. But if a guy has sex when he shouldn't, he could lose everything. And if a girl completely refuses to have sex, she gains complete power over him. Now this setup doesn't just happen in the back seat of a Honda Civic on a Saturday night. The same system applies to businessmen, politicians, celebrities, even the clergy. And it's not only been this way throughout human history, it's basically driven human history. Let's look at the four ways that power and sex are connected. First, there are those who use power to get sex. Second are those who use sex to get power. Third, those who've lost power due to sex. And fourth, those who've held on to power by avoiding sex. So let's sneak a peek at the past and see how sex and power are interrelated, interconnected, and intercoursed. First up, using power to get sex. Researchers have a name for people who deliberately accumulate power in order to get more sex, men. The theory is that women are attracted to men who hold positions of power. And in fact, throughout history, the world's most powerful men have had access to more females than a bull elephant seal. And who's the most powerful man in Canada today? Yeah, okay, but before him. Okay, uh, ooh, yikes. Uh, you know what, let's, let's start over. So who's the most powerful man in the world today? That's right. You may have heard about Bill Clinton's flings, but many other presidents were flingers too, and several of them were well flung. Welcome visitors to the Wonder Park Hall of the Presidents, where America's national leaders come to life. Salutation. I am Thomas Jefferson, third president of our great nation. I often lectured on the dangers of women when I wasn't sleeping with slave girls. I'm Franklin Roosevelt. Polio cost me the use of two of my legs, but luckily, not my third leg. Just ask my personal secretary, Marguerite. Howdy, I'm LBJ, with the emphasis on BJ. While General John Walker went out west to fight in the wars against the Indians, I made peace with his wife. Ick benign babe hounder. Bada boom, bada bing. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm George Washington, America's first president. I led the original 13 states from 1789 to 1797. During that era, I nailed over half a dozen married women. Bouncy, bouncy. George Washington slept here and here. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> and here. I'm James Buchanan and I never married. It's true, just ask the charming gentleman I lived with for 20 years. <laughs> I propose we land a man on Marilyn Monroe and then land his brother on her too. Everything's bigger in Texas. Ask not what a woman can do for you. Tell her. Who wants to see Lyndon's Johnson? I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> Lyndon, you're an amateur. Stop it. Stop it. Of course, it's not just political power that gets you sex. Every teenage boy knows that being in a group gets you groupies, eh? In ancient times, the 1970s, Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck, they were like totally showered with women's panties. These days, they're probably getting hit with Depends. But long before the electric guitar, there were other pop culture sex gods, the poets, the painters, the composers. Just like kings and queens, they were part of the glue that held society together. 
and lots of fans wanted to get sticky. Here's the poet you've been waiting for. He's mad, bad, and dangerous to know. It's Lord Byron. Hello, Venice. You know, just being here makes me feel poetical. While I've been here, I've been working on a new poem. It's called Dong Wong. It's over 16,000 lines long so far. I want a hero, an uncommon one, when every year and month sends forth a new one till after cloying the gazettes with Khan, the age discovers he is not the true one. But if you really want to see how power leads to sex, look no further than this guy, Henry VIII. He had more power and more sex than Donald Trump. Six wives and a feast of mistresses, and in my spare time, I built the English Navy into a serious fighting force. And that's what makes this country strong. My seamen, you're fired. Many historians consider Henry to be England's most powerful king ever. When the Pope said the church wouldn't grant me a divorce, I started my own church. <laughs> All kings were used to getting their own way, but taking on the church, that just wasn't done. You cross me, I excommunicate you, huh? and everybody's going to know you're not a good Christian. And then it's open season on you. You know what I'm saying? One of your dukes, the earls, is going to overthrow you and, and chop you up. Eh? Hmm? You're going to be dethroned and deboned. King Henry VIII dealt with Pope Clement VII the same way he dealt with women, unfortunately. The king approaches. Everyone look regal. Come on, people. Please <laughs> OK, OK, hold the mass. Hey, you, you're the archbishop. I need you right here, right now. You know, that jousting was fun, but I'm going to need this taken out of my leg. Go get a barber surgeon. Right away. He can fix my hair while he's at it. Yes, sir. You know something? I love this church. Primo investment. You, wife, you pregnant yet? Uh, no, sire, despite okay, how many fired. attempts to produce Here's what I want. I want to get rid of that one, and I want to marry, let's see, uh, you, right there. What's your name? Anne Boleyn. Great, fantastic. Let's do this. Uh, uh, Your Majesty, divorce is impossible. The Pope has excommunicated you. He what? You see, this is the problem with foreigners. That's a problem you get with them. Constant excommunication problems. Yes, OK, this is what's going to happen. The Pope is fired. But, but, no, but, and but, I hereby but, re-communicate myself and pronounce myself king of the church. You cannot do that. Hey, I'll tell you what, you're fired too, OK? Here, put that on. You're Archbishop. Yes, I sir. want a quick divorce, I want a quick wedding, and I want wine and wafers to go. I would like some of this. Uh, make that two wines, two wafers, one large, one small. <clears throat> we are gathered here and today. Don't worry about the ceremony. I do, she does, it's done. This woman is now my wife. And as I look deep into her eyes, you know something? I don't like her anymore. I changed my mind. Yeah. I don't know why I married her in the first place. I think she must have bewitched me. That's right, she's a witch. You're fired. Yes, as a matter of fact, start the fire. Let's burn her as a witch. Wait, wait, sir. <laughs> I was kidding. It's OK. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Chop her head off instead. Yes, sir. The ax for the ex. Yes, sir. Stop being such a yes man. Yes, sir. That's Using right. power to get sex is mainly a man's game. But a few women have played as well. Before Theodora became the wife of the Emperor Justinian, she was a burlesque queen. One Roman scholar claims the Empress was a nymphomaniac who frequented brothels. If it's true, she made the Holy Roman Empire a lot less holy. And then there is Russia's rogering regent, Catherine the Great. The stories about her ponying up with the horses are a myth. She preferred the studs who rode them. We are down to the last two finalists. Who will be the next Tsarina's idol? Who will win a high rank in the army? A place in the bed with Tsarina, Catherine the Great. Uh, Nikolai, I love 
everything you've done. You tried so hard in that last bedroom challenge. No, I'm sorry. I, I totally disagree. I mean, the whole point of this final round was to see if they could perform under any circumstance. So we put you into the bed of a bald, elderly, obese, ulcerated hag with terrible breath and a severe heart condition. And you flopped, majorly. And you're not even a major. And as for you, Sergey, at the start of this competition, I said you shouldn't even be on this show. But I was wrong. I got to give it up to you, bro. You kept it real. You've blown me away. You've blown us all away. You put that Sergey spin on it, gave it to her, I know I couldn't do it. Better you than me. <laughs> we are so impressed with your good looks, your, your knowledge, your charm, and your tight, firm But more than buttocks. that, I mean, you were willing to work. I mean, I could see in that final challenge that it took everything in you to fake a burning passion for an old woman who was, quite frankly, hideous. And I think we've all agreed in our verdict. Contract with a large salary and a high rank in the army. As well, you gain access to the most powerful woman in the world. Sergey, I just want to say that I know you'll do well because you remember that ulcerated obese hag from the final round? Well, that, in fact, is your new long-term girlfriend, Catherine the Great. So, Sergey, you'll be visiting her bedchamber every night. Congratulations. I don't know how you did it, but you did, and you will, again and again. <laughs> Catherine and Theodora are shocking figures because they did what guys do. They used power to get sex. But they were unusual because women don't need power to get sex. They just need the right words like, hello. What women could not get so easily was political power, wealth, freedom. Which brings us to our second sex power connection. Using sex to get power. Stay tuned, it's gonna get dirty. In a good way. Hey Welcome back to History Bites, Sex and Power. Over the years, many women did what men did, parlaying sex appeal into financial or political gain. And many of the political figures started out as actresses. Princess Grace of Monaco, Madame Mao Zedong, Argentina's Evita Perón, and Evita's Madonna Ciccone. Then there's Elizabeth Taylor. She used her sex appeal to marry into political power, wealth, and fame, just like her most famous movie character, Cleopatra. When it came to trading sex for power, Cleopatra wrote the papyrus. Legend has it that she had herself presented to Julius Caesar rolled up in a carpet, and they hit it off. Hence the expression, a quick shag. Hey, Julius. I hear you're a Caesar. Why don't you seize me? My carpet is soft, luxurious, and easy to lay. I'm also ovulating right now, but don't let that put you off. And Cleo oh. didn't get rug burns for every Tom, Dick, or Hotep set her and we. She was from the Ptolemy dynasty, and they only married family. Her first hubby was her brother. So when she started sleeping with Romans, that wasn't pure love, that was power politics. Julius, won't you help me get rid of my brother? I hate sharing Egypt with him. I want Egypt all for myself. Um, and for your son, of course. Hey, sis. Oh, sorry, it's been so long since we've talked, but I had a baby boy. Isn't that great? Shh. Anyway, I thought that we could celebrate by having you put to death. You know, just to be on the safe side, make sure you don't produce any rival heirs. Oh. Hey, Mark Anthony. Why don't you dump your wife and marry me? Then you can hold me in your big, strong armies. Another sexual and political powerhouse was Madame de Pompadour. She was the mistress of King Louis XV of France. They say the champagne glass was modeled on the shape of her breast. Your Majesty, everyone's having fun but you. What's wrong? Oh, mon Dieu. I'm vexed at the scurrilous tongues who 
prattle on and on and on about Madame Pompadour's physical beauty, oh. her natural asset. Oh. Uh, they forget she's very astute of mind. Mm -hmm. She's gifted in a social grace and she's mistress of wit and charm. Yes, sir. Not to mention very insightful about policy. Uh, indeed. Your Majesty, I propose a toast to your wonderful, magnificent consort, Madame Pompadour. <laughs> ah, oui. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Bottoms up. And when their relationship ran out of steam, Madame de Pompadour went from being Louis' Madame to being his Madam. Ah, Madame Pompadour. Last night was wonderful. Such passion, such rapture, such exquisite physical ecstasy. I'm so glad you liked it. Oh, oh. Last night was... Oh, Miss O'Murphy, the Irish girl. Do you want her again for tonight? Or perhaps you'd like to give her sister a spin? Oh, may we? Oui. And I'd like a Prussian princess for my wake-up call, girl, something. Oh. Bouncy. I'll book that right away. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, Your Majesty, I just have to engineer the treaty of Versailles. Ooh, well. Now, there have also been men who have used sex appeal to gain power. Name any movie star Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Robert Redford, Chris George Clooney, Bob yeah. Bainborough. Yeah, not literally. As for politics, Canada's legendary Pierre Elliott Trudeau knew how to sustain an election. Sir John A. MacDonald was a bit of a lady killer when he wasn't killing bottles of whiskey. The ancient Greeks believed that a soldier's fighting spirit came largely from having sex, just not on leave, in the barracks. I am Alexander the Great. Hooray! On the eve of this battle, we welcome to our midst a new general. Hooray! Let us welcome our comrade, General Parmenian. Hooray! Now, before I lead you fine men into battle, I wish to instill in you my fighting spirit. And I want you to instill in me your fighting spirit. So let's, yes, take off our clothes. And you can instill me and give me your precious essence, your vital power. <laughs> Permission to fall on my sword, sir. Permission denied. Now. Which one of you will share with me their fabulous fighting spirit? <laughs> I mean, who will be the lucky one? The new guy said he wouldn't mind doing some instilling, sir! Yes, Parmesan said he wouldn't mind at all. Parminion, actually. Did he now? Oh. <gasps> Ooh, let's pull some rank. <laughs> If you know what I mean. Come on, you big beefy mountain, let's go. <laughs> Understand, this wasn't about sexual orientation, it was more like physical orientation. After all, if you were on top or behind, right. then you yourself. were in the position of power. You, you were the man. What's the matter? Oh, I, I had sex with this young guy. Oh. oh, good for you. I mean, you know, that's how we inspire our youth, help them to become great warriors. I remember it sure made me want to kill someone. You don't, you don't get it. I let him be on top. What? What were you thinking? No, I'm ashamed. The theory that if you have the lower position, you're a woman is an ancient belief, and it still holds true. Today in Oman, a conservative Muslim country, about one in 50 men are a Zanif, a male prostitute who services other men. They are women because they are on the bottom, subservient. In a country where women are separate and out of sight, Xanaths serve an important role. As women. But usually, if a man is gonna use sex to get power, it's with good old-fashioned sex appeal. They say Britain's Benjamin Disraeli knew how to charm the bloomers off of his boss. Queen Victoria. Your Majesty. Prime Minister. Oh, please, Your Majesty, call me. Mr. Disraeli. Mr. Disraeli? Or Benjamin? Benjamin? Or Ben Ben? <laughs> ben Ben? As you wish. Uh, whoops. Uh, excuse me. Your Majesty, I have a request. Mm -hmm. Is there something I'd like to show you? Uh. 
I'd like to buy control of the Suez Canal and annex the Transvaal in South Africa. Transvaal. And double my salary. <sighs> Hot, humid, moist Transvaal. <sighs> Deep, long, wet canal. <sighs> Huge, expanded income. Yes, please. Thank you, Vicky. Coming up, sometimes sex can cost you everything you've worked for, everything you've strived for, everything you hold near and dear. But it's worth it. If history has taught us anything, and my history teacher always claimed that it would, it's that sex and power are a dangerous mix. I mean, sure, a promiscuous monarch may have a ton of fun, but they can produce dozens of illegitimate children who then proceed to fight to the death for the family fortune. And that's not good. If history has taught us something else, it's that for powerful people, going without sex is just not an option. Not even for a few hours. So the high and mighty found a way to have their cake and eat it too. Throughout history, the rich and powerful have slept with anyone they felt like. But when it came to official baby making, well, that had to be with just the right person. And now, let's meet our bachelors. Bachelor number one is 15 years old. He's from Tuscany. He likes fencing, taxing peasants, and building battlements. Please welcome Gascoigne de Tuscany. Buongiorno, Lance. <laughs> All right, bachelor number two has just returned from a crusade to the Holy Land. And now he just wants to settle down with a girl who has enough wealth to pay off his debts. Please welcome Ludwig of Liechtenstein. So much debt. My God. Great. And now, bachelor number three is a petty noble who wants to lead his own army someday. And in his spare time, he likes to finance cathedrals. Please welcome Sir Benedict of Normandy. Oh, it's uh, wonderful to be here. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Now it's time to meet your bachelorette. She's the daughter of the Baron of Kent. Please give a big welcome to 12-year-old Mary of Kent. And how is young Mary today? My daughter is fine, safely ensconced at my summer estate in Kent. And if any man dare lay a hand on her without my blessing, his people shall know nothing but suffering and death. OK, all right. Um, that's the number one. My daughter writes, I ask you to take me for a walk on a nice sandy beach, but we don't have a beach. What do you do? I invade the next dukedom. I put his castle to the torch. I scatter his peasants, and then I take you for a walk on his beach. Mm. Nice. That's the number two. What would you do if I asked you for a nice romantic walk in the lovely sand? Not this sand. The blood red sand. Men cut to pieces. Mine God, save our demons! <laughs> um, bachelor number three, same question. I would tell you not to be such a foolish little woman and give you the back of my hand. Yes, I like a man with traditional family values. Nobles were always trying to marry their kids to each other. When a king came of age, ambitious families would flood the palace with their daughters, hoping one would catch the king's eye and give the family some royal connections. Except with um, King James I of the uh, King James Bible, word quickly got out that he wasn't interested in anyone's daughters. Well, son, we'll be getting to the palace soon. Of course, when we arrive, we'll... Uh... You want to freshen up before you meet the regent. Yes, Papa. I want to make a good impression on Queen Jane. <laughs> oh, that reminds me about, uh, about Queen Jane. Yes. Well, you know, you may have heard me wrong. It's not actually Jane. It's, uh, it's James. James the First. <laughs> James? That's a funny name for a girl. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it would be. But, uh, well, you know, James is rather funny. <sighs> Is she pretty? Oh, yes, yes, oh. very pretty, very feminine, very... Yes. ...perfectionate. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like quite the queen. He is. You mean she. Well, now, uh, 
Here's the thing, son. Queen James is actually a man. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. No! Yes. It's King James, actually. Does anybody else know? Well, yes. everyone but him, apparently. <laughs> now, you want to make a good impression, so I would wear a little more lace. What? No! I'm not marrying a man. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life with a man. Oh, come on now. You spend most of your life with men already. The hunting and the jousting and the carousing. Oh, don't forget it. Listen. Think of the titles. Think of the, the land. Think of the, the wealth. Uh, uh, King James I actually did father a son. Like so many straight kings, he closed his eyes and thought of England, or Lancelot. Okay, so we've seen that a lot of women and some men have used sex to get power. But what happens when a sexy, powerful woman teams up with a sexy, powerful man? Well, you get a lot of sex, but you also get a sexy power couple. And some of those power couples have really ruled. From Belle and Hillary, to Ronald and Nancy, from Pierre and Maggie to Samson and Delilah. The power couple is the ideal arrangement for accumulating and exercising power. If only the guys could keep it zipped. Which brings us to our third sex power connection. Losing power because of sex. Remember Gary Hart and his run for the presidency? Me either. When was the last time Michael Jackson sold out a stadium? Or would you still want your photo taken with George Michael? And erections can cost elections, just as Congressman Mark Foley, Senator Larry Craig, and sins of the flesh spelt damnation for televangelists like Jim Baker, Garner Ted Armstrong, and Jimmy Swagger. Canada's had its share of sex scandals from Pierre and Margaret Trudeau to Belinda Stronach and Peter McKay, and covering up sex cost our top lawman his job when Francis Fox got an abortion for his girlfriend. But back in the 60s, a woman with the sexy name of Gerda Munsinger slept with a number of members of the Diefenbaker cabinet. Well, hey, it was the 60s, who didn't? But she was an East German spy. That resulted in a legal investigation which led nowhere in particular. But there are no hard and fast rules. Some people can shrug off a scandal. Julius Caesar was supposed to have described himself as every woman's man and every man's woman. His followers didn't seem to mind. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Caesar's horny and he's bald. Caesar's horny and he's bald. He wants your daughter in his bed. He wants your daughter in his bed. But he'll take your son instead. But he'll take your son instead. Julius Caesar was assassinated more for hoarding power than his sexual peccadilloes. But some subsequent Caesars were less fortunate and more decadent. I mean, everybody loves a lover, but nobody really desires a depraved degenerate. Here are five Caesars who proved absolute power corrupts absolutely. Meet Nero. He fiddled with his fiddle and boys. He castrated and married one kid. Committed suicide before his soldiers could do the job. This joker is Tiberius. He liked gay group sex, forced gay group sex, in generous portions, murdered. Caligula. He raped his sisters, then married one. He invited powerful Romans over for dinner, then had their wives for dessert. Everyone hated him. Murdered. Meet Heliogabalus. Only urinated in gold cups. He had his staff procure men with big staffs. He dressed in drag and tried to marry his chariot driver. After four years of debauchery, the army revoked his job. Murdered. Caracalla, quite a fella. Killed his brother in his mother's arms. Built the biggest baths in Rome. Couldn't wash off the filth. Killed by his own troops while urinating. Cut off in midstream. So if too much nookie can cost you power, what happens if you rein it in? What happens is our fourth sex power connection. Withholding sex to gain power. Can withholding sex give you power? And if so, is that why it's lonely at the top? In most societies, the nobility are required to marry other nobles. Cleopatra did her bit to bring in some outside connections, but that was unusual in her family, because when the Ptolemies ruled Egypt, the only people who were considered to be good enough to be in the royal family were already there. 
I'm Ptolemy the Eighth, I am. Ptolemy the Eighth, I am, I am. I'm getting married to my sister next door. And to my niece, who I love even more. And every kid is a Ptolemy. I wouldn't have a Zacchaeus or a Yo. We're an inbred clan of Ptolemies. And all of us can play banjo. Any geneticist will tell you that marrying cousins tends to produce more girls. And since most societies require men to be in charge, producing an heir and a spare gets more and more difficult. It may explain why one Egyptian dynasty after another died out. European monarchs didn't marry close siblings, but hobnobbing nobles did pay a price for swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool. By the early 1800s, the European monarchy shared a few last names and a whole bunch of DNA, and the results were not pretty. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> I'm, I'm His Majesty, King George, and I must say, I dearly, sincerely, do want to pull my pants down and expose myself to you. <laughs> Wibbly woo! <laughs> I'm Princess Maria. I'm from Portugal. I'm a big girl. I make boom boom in my pants! <laughs> my name is Paul. I am Tsar of Russia. In my spare time, I like to throw food at things and watch my servants clean it up. <laughs> boom boom boom! Let's go back to my room! <laughs> I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be the king. My older brother, Philip, he was supposed to be king, but he went, woo, 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 woo. Hello, I'm Christian of Denmark. A Christian the seventh, actually. Seventh. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bye bye, Philip. <laughs> Will you marry me? I don't drink, nor do I chase women. I live a very modest life. But sometimes. It's just. I'm so sad. Prince Ferdinand says that he will inherit the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Last month was my birthday, actually. I turned 23. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. And I like girls who are sincere. And long walks in the park. 21, 22, 23. I was born in our year of the Lord, 1,780. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I know what you're thinking. Oh, whole oh, big comedy skit. Oh, 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 big exaggeration. Wrong. Victorian constitutional expert Walter Bajet wrote, in the year 1802, every hereditary monarch in Europe was insane. And he was right. He wrote that in 1867, the year of Canadian Confederation. Gives you some idea why Canada was trying to leave Europe behind. Of course, you can avoid inbreeding by avoiding breeding. And that, oddly enough, can be a tremendous source of power. Remember how Henry VIII proved a king trumps a queen? Sometimes several of them? Henry's daughter, Elizabeth I, was a chip off the old block. Smart, tough, helped establish England as the world's leading naval power. But unlike Henry, Elizabeth avoided sex. She was the virgin queen. <laughs> well, I have completed the medical examination, Your Majesty, and you'll be glad to know that your virginity is still a-okay! <laughs> Let's get on with another day of glorious virginity. 
What have we got? Well, we've got a courtyard full of European kings and nobles who want to marry you, Your Majesty. They're really interested in the whole virginity thing. <gasps> the unspoiled, the undiseased. Great. Well, you know the routine. Begin the negotiations, let it drag on for a little bit, and then after some time, we'll say that I was offended by something and I've changed my mind. <laughs> oh, and keep reminding them that I'm a virgin. Very good. <laughs> Uh, is Philip of Spain on the list? Not today, no. Really? Well, I'll show him, ignoring my virginity. Drink! <clears throat> Go and attack some of Philip's ships. Ah, your majesty. Uh, he hates that. <laughs> okay! <laughs> Listen here, Liz. <laughs> I've been talking with some of the other nobles, and we've had it with you. We do not want some slip of a thing on the throne. We want a king. We want heirs. Now, what we demand to know is when My, are you going... your eyes are lovely. What? You know, I'm a virgin. <laughs> uh, yes, I know. <laughs> are you married? Oh, well, uh, not exactly. Oh, oh, you'd make a gorgeous king. We should talk, shouldn't we, you and I? Mm? Oh, well, yes, I'll, I'll call you then. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that you were saying about the other noble? Oh, no, nothing, nothing. It's all the tempest in a teacup. Oh. Yes, I'll look after it. So. Lovely. Yes, goodbye. Ta-ta. <laughs> yes. Careful. <laughs> yes. Oh, oops, excuse me. <laughs> Find out who that was, and make sure we have at least two romantic walks, and then chop off his head in six months. Very good. The idea of a virgin queen seems almost medieval, or at least early Renaissance. But hey, a key reason that Charles chose Diana was that she was a virgin. As a rule, it's women who withhold sex to gain power. But as we'll see, sometimes it works for men. And when it does, it's always painful. Back in 1810, a Toronto magistrate named Alexander Wood investigated a rape case, and that investigation led to a sex scandal of its own. The victim, Miss Bailey, has given me a description of a rapist's nether regions. Now, gentlemen, if you would be so good as to <clears throat> remove your breeches, I will examine you for distinctive markings, <laughs> size, <laughs> texture. Yes. The ensuing charges against Wood were discreetly buried and he was allowed to leave the country. Another way sex can cost you power is through disease. Today it's AIDS. Before antibiotics, it was syphilis. And medical experts say a lot of famous folks displayed all the symptoms. At this point in the concert, I'd like to take a few moments to remember the victims of a terrible disease that touches all of us. Syphilis the great pox, or as we English call it, the French disease, or as the French call it, the English disease, or as you Italians call it, the Greek affliction. <clears throat> Julius Caesar and Tiberius had cases that were rather serious. Explorer Ferdinand Magellan discovered a very nasty swelling. While Cook and Cortez sailed the seas to stake their claim to this disease, Henry VIII was well-respected, proud and regal, and infected. The spouse of Mary, Queen of Scots, was covered with suspicious spots. Tsars Paul I and Ivan the Terrible had cases that they found unbearable. Hitler too and Mussolini, they fought invasions of the weenie. It drained their essence and fouled their sap. Now, who would like to give me the clap? In the era of plagues and poxes, sex was dangerous. Isaac Newton wisely died a virgin, as did the composer Handel, the painter Degas, and a shelf full of children's authors. Isn't Peter Pan Michael Jackson's favorite book? And some guys choose celibacy as a career move. In medieval times, joining the church meant free food, clothes, and rent. Price was celibacy. Now other faiths have done without. Buddhist monks are celibate, as are Hindus who master the Vedic way. Some sects of Jews and Sikhs abstained, as did early Sufis. But celibacy is tough, and many early Christian monasteries and nunneries were hotbeds of sin. I'm guessing those ones had a waiting list to get in. 
Now, in some societies, celibacy wasn't necessarily an option. Some men had it um, thrust upon them or snipped off them. I'm a Mandarin. And I'm a eunuch. I'm a PC, powerful Chinese. I'm also a court official, but I'm emasculated. I serve our emperor, but sometimes I like to seize power and crash the system. Really? I just like to serve the emperor. What about ambition and the emperor's concubines, you know, with the, with the bound feet and the yin the yang and doesn't hot-blooded lust run through your system? Wow. Uh, no. I use the eunuch system. Unix? Eunuch. I actually guard as women. Wow. You can do that? Yeah. But don't you crave power? Nope. I don't have any floppies, so I don't get scuzzy thoughts. The mandarins ran China's government, but the eunuchs were more trusted because they couldn't get the emperor's wives pregnant. And with no families to look after, they hung with the emperor 24-7. Giving up sex gave China's court eunuchs tremendous political power. I wonder if the same thing holds true in the prime minister's office. It would explain a lot, wouldn't it? But the most significant virgin in history is Mary, mother of Jesus. She didn't exercise much power during her lifetime, but in the centuries that followed, people got more and more enamored with the idea of a virgin mother of God. Mary's rising popularity caused problems for the church because up until then, the Christian religion had mostly been about men. For men, by men, amen. Okay, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I think it's been a fabulous synod. We've all done some really dynamite work here. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> it is agreed that women are evil. Mm -hmm. Women are weak and short with unsightly bumps. Women are corrupt. <laughs> women should stay in their place. What about Mary? What? Mary, the, the, the Virgin Mary, she wasn't weak and evil and all that stuff, was she? Well, of course she was. They're all sinful, trust me. What? The blessed ever virgin? The unsullied mother of our Lord and Savior, chosen by God himself, whose breast suckled the Lamb of God. Can you believe this guy? No. He, he does have a point. She is in a different league. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, right, sure. Pick, pick, pick. It is agreed that women are evil, except Mary. Women are weak and short with unsightly bumps. Except Mary. After making all these exceptions, this man's church had opened the doors for other women. A huge, powerful, male-run organization couldn't resist the idea of a perpetual virgin. Women smell skanky, except Mary. Happy now? So, sex and power are intimately connected. People use power to get sex and sex to get power, even when it blows up in their face. But it all begs the question, why? Why these weird differences between the male and female approaches to sex and power? To understand, we need to look past history to prehistory. Meet the Venus of Willendorf. She's about 25,000 years old, and she gives us a glimpse of how things used to be when humans worshiped the goddess, the sacred feminine, the beehive-headed big boob lady. And yet today, 99% of the world worships male gods, male sons of God, male prophets. So what changed? There's an interesting theory that it all started when humans first domesticated animals. And I won't make any more babies. Yes, ma'am. That's all I am to her is just another hunter-gatherer. You know what, I, I noticed something. You know the way those goats do it? Oh, man, ever since we've started keeping the goats captive, all you do is sit around and watch them do it. <laughs> you gotta let up. People are starting to talk. Really? Yeah, because we invented language. People are starting to talk. Okay, you see, I, I've been keeping track, and, and when there's no males in the pen, then none of the female goats get pregnant. None. Right. Yeah. Probably a coincidence. No, 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 come on. No, it happens all the time, right? You get a male in the pen, there's a lot of sex, and then all the females get pregnant. It's just like it's the same with the chickens, and it's the same with the sheep. I don't get it. Oh, oh here, look. As humans settled down and domesticated animals, they finally made the connection between sex and childbirth. Yeah. Males realized they had power right. through sex. Yeah, you get it? Right, yeah. but what you're saying is that then us, the men were kind of 
Responsible for babies? Exactly! And, and it's not just with goats, man. We're the studs! We're the love machine! We're a crucial part of that process. We are a critical part of that process. We should be running things around here. No yeah. more goddess, yeah. like a god, duh. You know, we should put ourselves in positions of power. You know, we, we could start making uh, sexist remarks. Yeah, invent sexual harassment. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and we'll be the ones to have all the sexual partners. Uh, <laughs> not too loud. The wife will hear you. That's the theory anyway. It's prehistoric times, nothing's written down, so we don't really know what they were thinking. So I guess it's all pretty simple when you get right down to it. Sex is power, and power is sex. And boys and girls are different, and so they use sex and power in different ways. I know, I know, it's, it's sexist, it's wrong, it's positively prehistoric, but it's what's so. So boys, remember, if you want to have power, have as much sex as you can. And girls, remember, love waits and power waits with it. Now get out there and mingle. That's the formula that has kept humanity in a tangled mess throughout history. It's probably why history bites. Albrecht Dürer started bitching, went from etching onto itching. Nietzsche told his favorite doxy, what does not kill me makes me poxy. Jonathan Swift was swift to rot, but then got sores on his lilliput. John Milton liked to fool around, Paradise Lost and VD found. Tolstoy's case was fairly mild, but this disease drove Oscar wild. Goethe too was quite the poet, had the pox and didn't know it. So did men as pure and fine as theologian Tom Aquinas. Erasmus, too, had an attack in praise of folly in the sack. While Alexander Borgia Pope tried to wash his off with soap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.